introduce our guest speaker, our first uh, keynote, so to say, of the, of the meeting. Um, so, um, Santiago Madriñan. Santiago Madriñan obtained, he obtained his bachelor degree at the University of Los Andes in 1987, and he obtained his PhD in Systematics Botany at Harvard in 1996. He's, been, he's now a full professor at the University of Los Andes and the current director of the Jardín Botánico de Cartagena, so I, I think several of you had already the chance of meeting him. Um, he's also a corresponding member of the Academy of Science uh, in Colombia, and a, res a research associate at the Royal Botanical Garden Kew in 2002, the New York Botanical Garden in 2007, the International Tropical Center at Florida, at Florida International University in 2015, and he works with neotropical plant evolution, paramus, and seasonally dry tropical forests. He has published five books, uh, seven book chapters, and 56 papers in, in, the, in the areas of floristics, anatomy, morphology, systematics, and evolution, and, and the evolution of biota in paramos, uh, seasonal dry tropical forest and conservation, systematics of the Loraceae, DNA barcoding, ethnobotany, and economic botany, and the history of botany. And he has one specimen name in, in his honor. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Santiago for his talk on the natural and cultural history of the Col Colombian Caribbean region. Welcome, Santiago. Thank you, Juan, for um, I am honored to be here speaking to all of you at this inaugural address. This uh, idea was originated three years ago when Lucy and I were in Ibagué, and we talked about the, con the, uh, the upcoming Congress, Congress and um, we thought that uh, as a local, and I am now a local here in the region, uh, I could give the audience an idea of, what, of where we are and what to do while you are here. And that's what I organized uh, for today for you. And I titled the talk, Natural and Cultural History of the Caribbean Region of Colombia. I will touch on um, six small points uh, which is where we are, the Caribbean Basin, and how the biogeography of the Caribbean has evolved. I will talk about the Colombian Caribbean region, within that, the three provinces, but particularly the Cartagena province, and then the city that we're, where we are right now, Cartagena Indias, and Turbaco, the nearby uh, city where the Cartagena Botanical Garden is based. We are in this vast area, this sea called the Caribbean Sea, which uh, akin to the Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean, this is our sea. This is the American sea. And it's multicultural. We have many, many, many countries, many colonies that have become countries, and many countries that speak different uh, languages from those colonial areas. And um, Cartagena is right here in the upper limit of the Colombian, of the southern, uh, South American continent in Colombia. It's not always been like this. When Pangea started bre breaking up 170 million years ago, the North American Laurasian continent, or the Laurasian continent with North, Mar North America here, and Gondwana began separating with a motion, uh, a, a southern eastern motion of Gondwana. As we can see here, this is, these are the Scottese models, which I've always been a fan of. Um, and right here, 
in the Pacific, we see a plate, a tectonic plate called the Caribbean plate, which carries with it some land masses that as the Caribbean plate incurses or has an incursion towards the gap left between North and South America, it carries these land masses and forms an arc that is now what we call the lesser and the greater Antilles. Lagging behind is another landmass, which will carry on migrating eastward and form the Panama land bridge that we see today that now unites or reunites Laurasia and Gondwana or the northern continent with the southern American continent. And thus, the Caribbean plate is established. Sorry, this is not the plate. We'll talk about that one later. <laughs> established as a, as, a, as a sea surrounded by volcanic arcs, present and past, and, um, and land masses or insular land masses in its western, um, in its eastern uh, margin, eastern and northern margin with a relative movement from, with, of the Caribbean plate from the, east, from the west to the east and pushing South America farther and farther away from North America to the right, although I don't promise a positive or negative correlation of that with the current political stances in the region. Biogeographically, the Caribbean has offered many wonderful stories. Well, first, we have what Gaylord Simpson called the magnificent isolation, no, the splendid isolation of North America and South America where two uh, biotas evolved independently for many years that were later united by what is called, what, what we saw the, was the, Panam the closing of the Panama land bridge or or the closing of the, of, the, of the gap with the Panama Isthmus, and migration to and from the two continents, uh, here depicted by mammal fauna from South America northwards and from North America southwards, as then being called by, again, Gaylord Simpson, the Great American Biological Interchange, one of the greatest biographical stories that we have ever heard. However, um, the closing of the Panama land bridge, which has been or had been uh, hypothesized to around three million years ago when these hypotheses were put, put forth, um, has been set back more and more, and we'll probably hear from Carlos Magdalena another earlier date during this uh, meeting. Uh, sorry, Carlos um, Jaramillo, sorry. I apologize, Carlos. Uh, Carlos Magdalena just discovered a new Victoria in, in, in Bolivia. Sorry. Uh, we will hear earlier dates of that closing of the Panama land bridge. But before that, before we knew those dates, a new, another hypothesis had been put forth which tracked the exchange of faunas either mammal or, um, or amphibian or, or, or herpetological faunas between North and South America much earlier than what was presumed with the Panama land bridge. And this was the Garlandia or the Garlandia um, um, biological inter in interchange hypothesis, which uh, explains distributions of mammals and insects and several different uh, groups of, of organisms in the Antilles uh, which could not be explained by uh, Simpson's hypotheses. And this is through a land bridge called the Great Antilles Avis Ridge, which we see here. But dispersal in the area can, have, can, be, can become by many means, not just by carrions or land bridges. We have, this is a, a map of currents in the Caribbean, where we, he, where we see the main Caribbean current pushing westward, and the uh, Colombia, Panama, Gaia, 
pushing around here, and this may be a means of dispersal, but more likely means of dispersal are the, and if, if uh, in paleoclimate models, we, we have things like what we see here from 1850, which are the tracks of hurric hurricanes in the region. These are means of dispersal that can account for much of the biodiversity within the Caribbean region. And fish, fishes in the Caribbean are quite important. And I point these far, four species of fish here because this is what you'll see in restaurants tonight, tomorrow, and during the, during the, the week. The sierra, is, um, a, um, a dark uh, meat fish, delicious. The mero, which uh, is endangered and I wouldn't uh, promote its consumption. The robalo, a white meat fish that, can, that is also served with uh, sauces in, in the region. And the king or the queen of the Caribbean dishes, uh, the pargo rojo or the red snapper, which um, can be found, the fish can be found uh, after they come, the fishermen come in the basurto market. Basurto market is a wonderful place where you can see local products being brought from all the whole region and from the whole country to Cartagena. And here, this is the fish area of the, of the part where the fishermen arrive here on, the, on this bay, which is here. And you will find all kinds of things. There are several tours that are given for, um, for visitors in the Basurto market. It's, it's quite a place. It's dirty. It's chaotic. Uh, but it really is uh, um, a, um, uh, a sign of, of, of Cartagena culture, which uh, I recommend you visit. And back to the red snapper, the pargo rojo now, the Caribbean plate, which if you are like fish, do not leave Cartagena without having one. This is the fried red snapper with coconut rice and plantain, fried plantains, which will be served on the beaches nearby and pretty much on any restaurant, high end, low end, in Cartagena. The Colombian Caribbean region is quite vast. This is a map of Colombian borders on the Pacific, on the Caribbean, and in the continent. As, as we can see, we have a quite vast amount of, of, of sea attributed to Colombia. This is because there are the islands of San Andres and Providencia and the case of Quitasueño, Roncador, Serrana, Serranilla, which uh, belong to Colombia historically and extend the land, the, the ocean area to, towards uh, Nicaraguan border. This has been contested by Nicaragua quite recently and there, there is uh, a new ruling that uh, has redrawn the uh, borders and before we had the light green border, now we have the blue, dark blue border with these two Serranilla and, and um, uh, Serranilla atolls um, with, uh, separated from the current area but all, also belonging to Colombia and a shared area with Jamaica on the north. The Caribbean region of Colombia is one of five Caribbean regions or six if you count as separate the insular regions, the Amazon, the Orinoco, the Amazon rainforest, the Orinocan um, savannas, the Andean mountains, and the Pacific Chocó region. And here is the Caribbean region, which encompasses from the northernmost part of Colombia to uh, close to the border with Panama. And there are several biomes in Colombia, and in particular. The biomes in the Caribbean region are the desert biome, mountain biome in the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta. The, re the yellow is rep represents the seasonally dry tropical forest and purple represented by the mangroves. But very important, we see these blue areas. These blue areas are huge, immense wetlands that are present in the Momposino Depression and further to the east. The Guajira, the northernmost part of Colombia, is mainly desert, 
Uh, and there is an incursion of a Ranton song called the Maquita with Cloud Forest. This is a dune which is within the Cloud Forest. The people are Arawak people with their own language. It's called, they're called the Wayu people. And they are mainly herders that herd goats uh, in these desert uh, landscapes. Further um, west, we have the, what was originally called during the colonies, the Santa Marta province. The Santa Marta province, this is the Guajira up north, and this is the Rio Magdalena. The Santa Marta province encompasses the Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta, and its foothills, and part of the Magdalena Valley, or the right bank of the Magdalena River. And here we have the tallest coastal mountain in the world, reaching up to a pro, uh, nearly 6,000 meters in only 50, meter, uh, 50 kilometer distance from the shoreline to the highest peak. And represented in this beautiful photograph that appeared very recently in, in Twitter by this professional photographer, where we have all the climate belts in this mountain in a very, very short and, and small space. From the um, beaches and the lowlands of the Tairona National Park, beautiful, one of the most beautiful parks in Colombia, for, if, for my liking, up to the highest peaks in Colombia, the Bolivar and the San and the Cristol um, Colon peak, peaks in, uh, in the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta. There, uh, uh, previous uh, pre-Hispanic, pre uh, pre-Columbian pre uh, inhabitants were the Tairona Indians with, who built wonderful cities. This is one of them, Ciudad Perdida, where pretty much in any ridge that you see in this vast mountain, you would find some, some type of um, assentamiento or, or dwelling of people. And they are inhabited by, today by their descendants, the Kogi, Ihka, and Arhuaco tribes um, who, are, uh, who hold the Sierra Nevada Santa Mata as, a, as, their, as their sacred ground. Many rivers flow from the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta, and this is the Palomino River. And if you, if you, if you travel that way, don't miss out on the Roscocho ride. These are inner tubings from, from tires, which are offered from, up, from, uh, from a few meters up the mountain, and you just float down these rivers, and it's a wonderful experience. And we have, again, in the Tairona National Park, the Bay of Nehuangi, and the capital city of the, of the region, Santa Marta, uh, with its beautiful beaches and its nearby city, uh, fishing, fisherman city, the uh, Taganga Bay. Further east, sorry, further west, we have the Cienega Grande de Santa Marta, an incredible sa um, saline uh, and huge saline environment with mangroves. There we have the um, Isla de Salamanca National Park, which I think there is a uh, field trip to this park during this Congress. And um, unfortunately, we also have what has been called the greatest environmental disaster in Colombia, which was with the building of a road that united Santa Marta with Barranquilla, we, uh, there was um, an interruption of the flow of seawater and fresh water to the mangroves, and we had this immense uh, mortality, ma mangrove mortality in the 70s. And as you all know, mangroves, because of their high growth rates, they do not keep their resting buds and they do not regenerate. The Cartagena province to the west is then lined by the Magdalena River on the east and then carries on to the Golfo de Urabá. And here is Cartagena and the Bay of Cartagena. I will, I will, I will zoom this out later. And before we talk about the Cartagena province in general, we have to talk about the Magdalena River with its very important influence on the Cartagena province. The Magdalena River Basin and the Mompos Depression 
uh, were created about five million years ago when the mountains of uh, the Andean Cordilleras of the Northern Andes uh, um, uh, uh, had their final stages in, in uplift. And here we see this 3D interpretation of the Magdalena River Valley starting in the southern part of Colombia and flowing northwards towards the Caribbean Sea. And also the Cauca Valley, which flow, flows northwards and meets the Magdalena River at the Montpós Tectonic Depression. That depression can be seen here in 3D as a huge, huge um, humedal, uh, wetland, which was inhabited by the Senu people uh, in pre-Columbian times. These uh, people were uh, uh, quite advanced. They had a uh, incredible uh, culture. You can see uh, special exhibits about the Senu people at the Gold Museum of the National Bank here in Cartagena. There, it is a branch of the Gold Museum in, in Bogota, and they have they dedicate themselves to the Senu culture, which is also been called the Senu amphibious culture, which inhabited these uh, wetlands. And some of you who traveled from Bogota flying and were sitting on the left part of the plane may have seen these huge, vast lands of wetlands right now. And they are uh, in their prime of inundation because we have had a very severe uh, rainy season recently. The people here lived in lacustrine um, uh, buildings, but very interestingly, they left these archaeological marks on the, on the ground. These are uh, canals, channel, can canals that were used to uh, divert the floods and to plant, to be able to plant uh, crops year round, even though the water would be, or normally would be flooding this area. These uh, can be seen from, from, from the sky, and um, it's, they are a wonderful relic of this immense culture, which still thrives today in Sucre and um, Cordoba regions, and some of Bolivar, which is uh, the department. This is a Senu house today, and this is part of the Senu culture, which is the famous Sombrero Volteado, which comes from the water grass Hinerium Sagittatum. The main vein is, um, is, um, is harvested, and then several uh, strands are woven together into, into um, cintas, into, uh, into cintas. And, <laughs> and uh, depending on the number of strands that are woven, this is a 21, which is 21 strands, the, the, the finer, the more, the, more the, 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 the better the, the hat. Uh, you will commonly find a 15 or a 17 strand hat here at a low, relatively low price. But if you want a real nice one, which can go up to 2 million pesos, you can get a 23 or 20, 27 strand hat, which you can fold and bend and uh, it'll last forever. Uh, they are adorned by uh, Senu culture um, uh, patterns, and they are beautiful. I saw somebody with one here today. Also, the Magdalena has a huge river delta. This is how um, uh, Humboldt depicted the mouth of the Magdalena River. And as we can see here on, uh, from Calamar, on, on, onwards to the west, we see this tributary of this delta. It is a part of an, an, an altered mouth of the delta. The Magdalena River, uh, this is a view from the Caribbean onto the continent with the Sierra Nevada Santa Marta over here. The Magdalena River currently uh, has its main mouth over here, but sedimentary uh, sedimentation has, has shown us, uh, studies in sedimentation has shown us that this has not always been the case. The Magdalena River originally flowed out through Barranquilla, which is where it currently flows out of, but uh, in the middle Pliocene, it came through Cartagena, and then it has changed directions and back to Barranquilla during, uh, in the Holocene. The, way, the reason it changed directions is because of the 
uh, um, a resurgence of these belts. These are the Senu, Sinu and the San Jacinto belts, which interrupted the flow of the Mar Magdalena River in this direction. And this is the, the current direction of the flow of the Mar Magdalena River. We see several mud um, uh, volcanoes and mud um, underwater and, and earth volcanoes, product of this tectonics which have formed uh, an incredible tourist attra attractions here. This is the Volcan del Totumo, which is just uh, an hour north of Cartagena, uh, uh, one of the biggest mud volcanoes in the area. And we can see here uh, how people come up and have their mud baths in the mouth of the volcano. Uh, there are several of these. Uh, they are, these are dioperisms that are scattered throughout the region. The Magdalena River carries a bunch of sediment from, the whole, from all of the Andes, erosion across the Andes from the whole length of Colombia. And this sediment extrudes into the Caribbean Ocean, as we can see here. And the current, the main current in the Caribbean, the Caribbean current, takes this sediment off to the west. But there is also a coastal current that takes the sediment through the coast all the way down to Cartagena. Thus, the beaches in Cartagena are sediment beaches. These are brown beaches, and you may have already seen that we don't, that we don't have those beautiful, pristine white beaches that you may have thought of visiting, not in Cartagena itself. This is uh, the beach of, um, uh, I forget the name. Uh, anyways, I just forgot it. This is La Boquilla. This is um, the, the blue beach of, of La Zona Norte, and this is Manzanillo. Uh, these are beaches here in Cartagena. And those of you who are staying in Boca Grande will see uh, the, the brown beaches again, the sediment beaches. These are sand, uh, brown, sed, brown, sandy sediment, sediment beaches, and you'll see uh, the coastal protection uh, efforts that have been made so that the, the, these sands do not uh, uh, to maintain the sandy beaches and to prevent the, sea, the ocean from coming into uh, uh, the city. Here, this is a very recent picture where a huge contract was laid out to um, try to save the, the, the road that, uh, that lines the beach near uh, Boca Grande. But remember, in the current, so we have this, the Caribbean current. Remember the Colombia Panama gyre, this one that thr uh, uh, thrills around. It's because of that gyre, and here shown in purple, that, that this current takes all the sediment of the Magdalena River northward. And thus, we have in the Rosario Islands and in the island of Baru, beautiful, pristine white beaches with wonderful. Uh, coral reefs uh, in the in the in the Islas del Rosario. Um, we have there is a wonderful oceanarium that I truly recommend you visit. And if you want to go to a white beach, go to El Rosario, or you could try Playa Blanca. But unfortunately, this is the current state of visiting of Playa Blanca. Um, if you like crowds, then uh, this is the place. The beaches, the white beaches, are caused by a wonderful friend, uh, the parrotfish. The parrotfish has been eating away corals for 5.6 million years and defecating the coral, the, carbon, the calcium carbonate, for 5.6 million years, on and on and on. And they are the ones responsible for these white beaches. Um, thank you. Parrotfish. <laughs> and so, in the area west of Cartagena, we have the islands of Rosario, a wonderful, wonderful area with, uh, with great coral reefs. And several parks have been named around the area. So we have the island, uh, Islas del Rosario National Park, which encompasses region, continental region, and then the, the Rosario Islands. And then we also have the uh, maritime area, or the protected maritime area of the Rosario and San Bernardo, which is down here. 
and the newly named uh, Parque Nacional Natural Corales de Profundidad. Uh, there are, unfortunately, some efforts to explore um, uh, petroleum in these areas, but these parks have played a very important role in uh, preventing those explorations from happening. Now, we saw the basin, we saw the Depresión Momposina, we saw the, the mouth of the Magdalena, and the Dique Canal is another very important uh, aspect. Remember during the middle Pliocene when the Magdalena River came out through Cartagena? Well, it left behind that mouth, which is now called generically the Dique Canal, and it's a series of swamps that were used by the early colonists to uh, go from Cartagena. This is Cartagena, the city. This is Tierra Bomba. This is Baru, Islas del Rosario. And this is the Bay of Cartagena, the larger bay. It was used to go to, to travel to the Magdalena River and then further and then carry on north, um, south, south to Onda and then to Bogota. So it's a series of swamps that have been dredged and rectified and, the, and, and levees have been put on them to uh, have a very important um, uh, means of transport for mer merchandise through what we now call the Dique Canal. And as I said, this was the means of transport in the early days. The Dique Canal then connects Car the Bay of Cartagena here with the Magdalena River in Calamar. And it has several regions which can pose um, great grave uh, threats. The lowlands of, uh, of, the, of the east uh, have, uh, the, uh, have been prone to inundations, especially in the Nina years. And the lowlands and mangroves of the west uh, have uh, been prone to inundations with the sea, uh, sea level rise. This happened in uh, 2010, 2011, when the Nina broke the levees and we had this immense and very, very harsh inundation. A huge government fund, the Fondo de Adaptación, was created to try to alleviate these problems. And back to the bay, the Cartagena Bay, we have what, uh, with the rectification of the canal, which was done by the Spanish, and then uh, by different works uh, during the 18th and 19th and 20th century, and the rectifying of, um, or, or the straightening of the lines, we have that the Canal del Dique uh, uh, ending in the Cartagena Bay has turned what was once a pristine coral uh, clear water bay. This is the center of Cartagena, Boca Grande, and Castillo Grande here. This is the corner, this corner of Castillo Grande where we can see the corals. This is during the dry season when sedimentation is low. But this is the story pretty much every day now. The Canal del Dique sending sediments to, uh, out towards the bay, as we can see here, and creating this new land. And especially in the Barbacoas Bay, these two other outlets creating uh, sending out sediments to the Barbacoa Bay, this is a seawater bay, and creating these lands. Uh, satellite sedimentation data has shown the high amount of sedimentation coming out from the DK on the Cartagena Bay, as well as the high amount of sedimentation coming out from the Barbacoas outlets, which are threatening the corals of the uh, Rosario um, National Parks and the, and the Corales de Profundidades. A huge project has come out recently to build two um, exclusas, dock, no, uh, locks, two locks, one in Calamar and one in Puerto de Abael. This is a, a, a depiction of how these locks uh, may become which will have an influence in not letting sediment come out to the Cartagena Bay nor the Bahia de Barbacoas, as well as not letting seawater come in to one of the main areas where Cartagena, our drinking water here in the city of Cartagena comes from, which is from up here. So this is a huge project. It's already been um, 
sent out for uh, licitation, and uh, it will nevertheless affect, although it will affect very, very importantly and positively the, the sedimentation in the Cartagena Bay and elsewhere, it, it, will have, it will affect very strongly the different communities that live in this area. Another big project has been proposed is to widen the entrance. This is the original entrance of the Bay of Cartagena in the fort of Boca Chica and San Jose, where huge ships come through. And, to, and this has to be dredged continuously, and it is a hazard for ships coming in and out. So there is an alternate channel that has been proposed over here, uh, just um, west of, of, of the current Boca Chica channel, as we can see here. However, a uh, recent uh, find of the Corales de Varadero and, uh, and um, a recent um, uh, 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 ideas by scientists or show, scientists showing the importance of these coral reefs that were unknown before is, uh, is uh, putting this project in uh, question. And now we go to Cartagena, where an early map depicts the two walled cities. We are here in Getsemani, in the island of Getsemani, and this is the walled city of the Centro Historico. Uh, this is where we are right now in the convention center. And as you can see, this was all swampland, and this has now all been filled by the Matuna. The city was walled completely. This is a bridge that unites the walled city of Getsemani in Calle, Calle Larga with the fort of uh, San Felipe. And this is the wall of La Torre del Reloj, one of the main entrances to the port or from the port into Cartagena, and over here we have the customs office, La Plaza de la Aduana. And behind we have what is now called the Arch of the Candies, or the Sweets, uh, where you can find all kinds of sweets. I'll talk more about that later. The, the walled city contrasts with the new city, the Boca Grande city, which is mainly a city based on sand dunes and, uh, and, and filling of land. And the city has beautiful views, these snow, uh, narrow streets for, can form a beautiful, beautiful city. And also the fortifications with their cannons, with their lookouts, and their churches. This is the cathedral. This is um, the, La Iglesia de San, San, San something. And <laughs> I forgot, sorry. And this is where the, the, their current Naval Museum is. I will, I'll, just, I'll just mention that. Um, uh, the Baluartes, which are um, uh, fortification uh, constructions with different angles to, to defend the city with their lookouts, are now beautiful places to have. They're, they're now turned into bars and restaurants. And the Santa, San Felipe Castle, built on a, on a hill, uh, where, where, where most of the gunneries were held during the colonial times. And there's also a very nice green, uh, coral mountain, the, um, the Cerro de la Popa, from which we have beautiful views. The fortifications in Cartagena were very important. It was one of the most pro, uh, de demanded bays in the world, in, in, in the Spanish tenancy because this is where all the gold came in from uh, Veracruz or uh, Colón or um, different parts of, of the continent came here. The ships assembled here and then they left in this huge fleet. And this is the attack of Vernon on the city of Cartagena in 1738. Uh, he tried to siege the city and attack the city. He even made, this is the English Captain Vernon, he even made two commemorative coins uh, celebrating the, the taking of Cartagena. And uh, unfortunately, because of the bravery of the Spanish Captain Blas de Leso, who, was, uh, uh, who only had one eye, one arm, and one leg, uh, defended the city. Uh, he is the hero of Cartagena. Uh, the British 
uh, made uh, or tried to conquer Cartagena many times. This is the attack on the San Jose. This is two, three British uh, man of wars attacking the San Jose uh, um, uh, ship, which was carrying gold that came from Panama. It was the ship that carried the most amount of gold uh, with three other galleons. And uh, the, the ship sank and is now, uh, has now been called the holy grail of all shipwrecks. And there has been several um, uh, times when it has been seen or it has been sighted, and the most recent was last month. And this infography came out. It is right out of Boca Chica in a very deep area. And pictures came out last month, last month of, the, of the treasures. This is a Chinese, um, uh, Chinese uh, dishes and uh, amphoras and golden coins and cannons that uh, we hope will remain as a museum uh, of archaeology, of archaeology, an archaeological find in a museum uh, recently. And to end, because we are, I think we're all hungry, the Cartagena cuisine, you must try all of these. This is the arepa de huevo the empanada de carne or the pollo, the carimañolas, these are, these are, these are corn-based, and this is cassava-based, and this is corn-based, but they are sweet. The arepa de huevo is a corn arepa with an egg inside it, perfect for breakfast. And these are the carimañolas de queso, which are, as I said, they are uh, cassava. Have this at breakfast with a nice juice, a juice of sapote or nispero or guanabana or mamey. And these are only some of the Caribbean uh, fruits of the Caribbean region. They are amazing fruits, which you can see here. This is the nispero or nisberry. This is the mamey, the um, sapote, and the, I have something with my memory, uh, caimito, and the caimito. And this is the Corozo palm, from which I think we have the most refreshing, thirst-quenching juice that you could ever have. If you want a snack, you can eat a pastel, pastel de carne. There will normally be um, a, a chicken or pork. These are rice pastels. Or you could have pork, gr pork rinds with cassava, los famosos chicharrones. Now, and these are generally served with corn uh, breads, which are wrapped in their own husks. And these can be sweet or, or savory, or they can also have coconut flavor in them. For lunch, try the Sancocho Costeño. The Sancocho Costeño traditionally served on a gourd, on a cal calabash gourd, with a calabash spoon. We'll have... Um, Carne seca, which is uh, a, a salt-dried uh, beef, and costilla, uh, and corn, cassava, and yam. Uh, that's the, the main ingredients. Or if you're vegetarian, you can try the mote de queso, which is a yam-based soup with um, fresh, salty um, uh, cheese. And the king or queen of the dishes in Cartagena is the posta cartagenera, a sweetened, uh, a, a boiled, sweetened piece of, uh, of beef with uh, coconut rice. And for dessert, why not try the enyucados, which are patties made of, uh, of cassava and cheese and some condiments, or the famous dulces, uh, these are uh, yams and, and uh, conserves of different uh, types of fruits, which are sold in uh, front of supermarkets and elsewhere. Uh, we have the mongo mongo, which is seven different kinds of fruit, all boiled with sugar. And um, if you see a palenquera walking around, do try their cocadas or the alegrías. The alegrías are sorghum, pop sorghum balls with coconut and sugar. And you can go to the 
parque, uh, portal de los dulces to buy these uh, dulces on the way. Finally, Turbaco, which is just near Cartagena on the outskirts, on the mountains here. This is where the first inhabitants of the region were, the Yurubaco Indians, very fierce Indians. They killed Juan de la Cosa, one of the most famous cartographers ever. He, he, he drew the first Mapamundi. Uh, he tried to uh, tell his, uh, his captain not to go to Turbaco, and uh, his captain didn't uh, um, pay attention. And uh, the Indians killed him with a hundred uh, venomous uh, arrows, killed Juan de la Cosa. There's a monument to Juan de la Cosa there. And this is the house, the colonial house, which was visited by many people, including Bolivar, and before that, uh, Humboldt. Humboldt was in Cartagena in 1801 on his way to Quito. And he spent three days in Cartagena where he, he thought the climate was horrible. He stayed in the worst hotel ever during his journey. Uh, the Spanish aristocrat ladies all wanted to marry him, so he fle fled very quickly to Bogota, and on a way he stopped in Turbaco where he spent 15 days. And this is what he had, had to say of Turbaco, where he also found mud volcanoes. How happy the days have passed in Turbaco so far. The climate is cool, the mountain, is, the mountain air is heavenly, pure, and refreshing. The town is on a hill in the middle of a wooden valleys where small streams flow, and they currently flow. What a panorama our garden offers. The valley and the mountains are covered in thick vegetation with majestic trees. Shortly after sunrise, the mist settles in the valley. The tops of the high bonga, ají, and caracolí trees stand out like archipelagos in the misty sea. At every hour of the day, the scene is transformed, but it's always enlivened by the thrills of wild birds. Nowhere in South America have we heard birds sing so tenderly with such deep chirps as around Cartagena in Turbaco. And this is where the botanical garden is. And I am sure this description of Humboldt was where the botanical garden is located now because of the streams that flow out from the earth. This is the Cartagena Botanical Garden with water year round. It has a strange vegetation because it's not typical of the dry season for, uh, seasonally dry forest of the region with wonderful animals today, like this taira and our um, emblematic, uh, emblematic frog, Dendrobates truncatus. And we have a program of reintroduction of TT monkeys or the, or the cotton tamarind monkeys, which were uh, endemic in the region but have been uh, uh, decimated. And we have introduced monkeys from, uh, monkeys that have been uh, taken from, from families or from people who have them illegally. We build the family groups and we uh, are liberating them. We have three family groups which are liberated for three years now and they have produced offspring for during the three years. These are twins that normally uh, come every year in, the, um, in these family groups. We work in the whole region uh, in the seasonally dry tropical forest which is a scant, uh, this, this is tree cover of seasonally dry tropical, for, tropical forest in the Cartagena, in the Cartagena province, uh, where only a very small percentage of this forest exists. And we have, fi in, to, to end, we have these uh, artists in residence program where Deidre Hyde, which some of you may know, uh, visited us this year and produced these wonderful depictions of the garden here and of the forest, of the dry, seasonally dry tropical forest, which are on display at our booth. And you will find more information about our garden at our stand or booth uh, at the display center. And finally, tomorrow we have a, a symposium on Noah's Arcs of the Anthropocene. This is Phyton. This is a picture by Francis Allais saying that we always see Noah's Ark with animals, but where were the plants? So botanical gardens are the Noah's Arcs of today. And with this, oops, no more. With this, I end my presentation and I thank you for
Okay. For your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santiago. This was a great talk. Uh, so now we'll move on to our cocktail. You are obviously all invited. It's going to be just outside the, in the conference center, but uh, on the terrace that is on the bay. So we will lead you there. Thank you. Gracias, Juan. ¿Qué tal estuvo?